Amid charges of fraud by the opposition leader, tensions are high in Kenya as the nation anxiously awaits the results of the presidential election. An American teenager's efforts to help young children in Uganda diagnosed with cancer. And Tanzania and Uganda launch an oil pipeline construction project. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, this is Africa 54. I'm Esther Gidu. You are in for Vincent Makori, who will join us live from Nairobi in a moment. It's high drama in East Africa where Kenyans have been glued to their television screens since last night, monitoring provisional presidential election results being released by the nation's independent electoral and boundaries commission. Kenya's Electoral Commission is using biometric voter identification and electronic vote transmission systems to conduct the elections. The vote is seen as a key test for the commission after voting technology failed during the last polls in 2013, sparking allegations of vote rigging. Election officials have up to a week to announce full results, but they may opt to announce the outcome as soon as possible to alleviate the possibility of violence. Kenya's opposition leader Raila Odinga says the Election Commission's computer system was hacked and fake results posted to show President Uhuru Kenyatta with a strong lead in a case of massive fraud. The 2017 general election was a fraud. In his words, Uhuru said that he did not need voters to win an election. And this is said in Turkana, repeated it again in McQueen. The hacking has definitely affected the results of the 2017 general elections. It's, it's a tragedy of monumental proportions and a total disaster. Now, following Odinga's claims, the chairman of the electoral body, IEBC, Wafula Chebukati, sought to reassure citizens, some who are getting increasingly anxious. Aspersions have been cast on the issue of resource transmission. Whereas we know that uh, the comments from Kenyans that the election went on smoothly yesterday, the certain aspersions have been cast on aspects of results transmissions by some stakeholders in the process. From what I understood, the only issue is on the results transmission, not on the whole electoral process. And that's why the commission is going a little bit a mile longer that instead of us just relying on the transmitted results we're also calling for the original documents for purposes of knowing and verifying before we do the final announcement the winner of the presidential election must receive 50 percent of all votes and 25 percent or more of votes in at least 25 of kenya's 47 counties if neither candidate hits that threshold a runoff will take place. Standing by live via Skype in Nairobi is Africa 54's managing editor, Vincent McCory. Good evening, Vincent. Uh, good evening, Esther. Now, Vincent, a very tense situation in Nairobi right now. What needs to be done by the IEBC to reassure Kenyans? Indeed, extremely tense. At uh, this moment, uh, the opposition candidate, Rilo Ding, of course, has kind of... Uh, uh, thrown everything into confusion by discrediting any of the results that we are seeing, the provision of results. And, uh, of course, the IEBC, the electoral body, has a hard time reassuring people that uh, these results can be credible. So uh, what it ne they need to do, of course, is to make sure uh, that they can uh, prove uh, that whatever they have, all the results they have received are accurate and they have a way of doing that they've assured this, uh, the nation that they have the forms that were signed at the polling centers uh, that are signed by all the agents of uh, the political parties that everybody will have access to all the parties will have access to and therefore the provisional results don't have to make anybody get so excited because the official results will be provided as soon as they tally all the 
forms, which they call 34A and B, and uh, confirm the final number. And so they are telling people, don't worry, we have a system, even if the electro electronic system had been hacked, even if that was the case, they still have a way of uh, verifying the results from the polling centers. So, Vincent, what is the, the general reaction of Kenyans as we speak? Of course, following the pronouncement by Mr. Raila Odinga that uh, whatever is out there is fraudulent and that the system has been hacked, there have been uh, a flare, there's been a flare-up of, uh, you know, some, some kind of uh, skirmishes in some parts of uh, Nairobi and parts of the country. Nothing very serious, but some youths uh, coming out to the streets, burning tires, uh, of course, chanting, uh, you know, slogans uh, demanding that uh, the real results uh, be uh, announced. And so we are seeing a situation which could escalate, but I think at this moment, it depends on what Mr. Raylat says to his supporters, but also how the uh, Electoral Commission handles the situation to uh, restore that confidence in their systems and, and, and convince everybody that eventually the correct results will be announced. Now, Vincent, has there been any efforts by the authorities to calm the situation very briefly? You know, at the moment, uh, not exactly. Uh, we, we haven't seen any serious uh, statement coming out, except for the IBC, of course, saying, uh, calm down, please wait until we give you the official results. I suppose they are not uh, worried at this moment, but we expect somebody to speak. Uh, sometime later, maybe tonight or early tomorrow. All right, Vincent, thank you very much. Africa 54's managing editor, Vincent Macquarie, reporting live via Skype from Nairobi. Now, for more analysis on the Kenyan presidential election, I'm joined in the studio by James Gundi. He is adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Mr. Gundi, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. You know, a very serious claim there by the opposition leader, Raila Odinga, about the hacking of the computer systems of IEBC, mm -hmm. also saying these are fake results. Mm -hmm. And, of course, massive fraud. What do you make of those very, very tough statements? They are worrisome. And they, those are statements that should worry everybody. Raila Odinga is... Um, a powerful voice in Kenyan politics. What concerns me uh, in his statement, in fact, is, a state, is when he says that the entire election, 2017 election, is a fraud. That's a very uh, conclusive statement that he's making. At this point, I am not sure that is a, st is a kind of statement he should make. I think uh, NASA, the opposition coalition, does have some valid concern, some reason to be concerned. The history of the country is a history where elections have been rigged, not just in the last 10 years, but you know, since uh, independence, we've had elections rigged. Malpractices in electioneering, that's something that happens quite a lot. But the concern I have at this point is when you have such conclusive statements that the entire 2017 election is a fraud, then you're already sending messages to your foot soldiers that there is nothing else that is going to happen except we are going to lose and we are going to lose unfairly. But again, uh, Dr. Gundi, the Electoral Commission Chairman uh, Webukati, uh, Chebukati says results displayed on their portal is uh, equally, you know, it's unofficial. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why even display these results in the first place? Because this is also very confusing mm -hmm. uh, until they say, you know, like Vincent said, until they are officially on Form 34A and B. Mm -hmm. uh, why bring the confusion then by displaying them on their portal? Uh, and I'm not sure that the IABC went out to bring confusion deliberately. I, I really think uh, the way I look at it is that IABC was in a no-win situation. So IBC wanted to keep people informed and provide results as soon as they could as a way of calming down tensions. But they made a mistake because if you are going to give any kind of results as a commission empowered to tally and provide results, people will have confidence that the results coming from IBC are credible and final. Okay, now very quickly, what do you expect when the official results are announced by the IEBC? What I expect is different from what I hope for. I'm hoping for peace. I'm hoping that um, 
sane minds will prevail. I'm hoping that we will see leadership. I think this is a time when true leaders will emerge and should be seen. So I'm hoping that whatever happens, one, IEBC can put confidence back into the system. I think what Vincent says is absolutely right. There is a deficit of confidence right now. IEBC must be trusted, and they need to do everything to win back that trust. And hopefully, whoever wins will be magnanimous in victory and will say the right things, and whoever loses will be magnanimous enough and accede and accept, at least concede uh, defeat, and at least encourage um, his supporters to, um, to maintain peace and to remain calm. That's my hope. I don't know what to expect. Uh, I can only cross my fingers and hope for the best. Let's hope for the best. Mm -hmm. All right, James, uh, thank you very much. Uh, James Gundy is a political analyst and adjunct professor at Georgetown University here in Washington, D.C. Now, South Africa's President Jacob Zuma faces the renewed challenge of uniting his country after narrowly surviving a no-confidence motion in the nation's National Assembly. Speaking to supporters Tuesday night shortly after the vote, Zuma instead hailed the African National Congress as the party of the majority, saying it is untouchable. They believe they could use technicalities in Parliament to take over the majority from the ANC. It's not Im it's impossible. They can't do it. We represent the majority in the public. No matter how many people they can collect and say this is the majority, it's not. It is unclear if Zuma is willing to begin a dialogue to mend relations with those of, of the opposing views. Meantime, the opposition is already signaling Zuma's political battles are not over. We are very disappointed, but we won't give up. We'll keep digging, digging. But we are disappointed because we work hard to make sure that we gonna, we did, uh, Zuma is going to fall. But we won't, we won't give up. On Wednesday, the opposition Democratic Alliance called for South Africa's parliament to be dissolved and a national election to be held. The alliance leader, Musi Maimane, says the party would bring the motion to dissolve parliament to the assembly on Thursday and request that it be debated as soon as possible. Now to a fascinating story about a remarkable young man, James Mooney, who is already taking a leadership role in helping some of the world's most vulnerable people young children diagnosed with cancer. Two hospitals are partnering together to address pediatric cancer in Barara, Western Uganda. VOS Paul Ndiho, along with Godfrey Barbedi, Badebi from our partner station NBS TV in Uganda, filed this report from Boston, Massachusetts. The World Health Organization reports over 200,000 children worldwide receive a cancer diagnosis each year. 90% of the death in children with cancer are in low-income countries where medical care is not available or inadequate to treat their cancers. Well, I've come here in Boston, Massachusetts to find out more about pediatric cancer and what are this partnership between Massachusetts General Hospital and Mbarara Regional Referral Hospital in southwestern Uganda is all about. It all started nearly three years ago when a young James Mooney was on a summer vacation with his parents visiting Mbarra Hospital and a village home of a sick child. This eye-opening journey inspired James Mooney to return with a plan to raise awareness for children with cancer by recruiting students to run in a race, Uganda's color run for pediatric cancer. One of the things we did first was the malnutrition ward. And that was kind of what struck me because it was a bunch of um, kids, obviously, like a lot younger than me. But they were really struggling and it was all just because, you know, they had a lack of nutrition, a lack of food. James Mooney comes from a generous family. Their Mooney Reed Charitable Foundation has given away more than 13 million in charitable contributions in recent years. The Mooney family is based in Boston, Massachusetts. James is developing his own interest in Uganda. The first day I arrived in Uganda was a bit of a culture shock because um, I got off the plane at like, I think 11.30 at night Uganda time. 
And um, the thing is, we flew into Entebbe, and Entebbe, at least compared to Boston, there's no lights or anything. So. <laughs> James Mooney and his family, in collaboration with Massachusetts General Hospital, have since built strong ties with Mbarara University and Mbarara Hospital, and promise to be a lifeline for those children diagnosed with cancer. Dr. Howard Weinstein, a chief of pediatric hematology on oncology at Mass General Hospital for Children, has made several trips to Uganda. Develop a childhood cancer program that involves um, training um, doctors, nurses, and pharmacists, and pathologists how to diagnose and treat children with cancer. Cancer in children differs considerably from cancer in people of all other ages. We don't know what causes childhood cancer, but despite that, we can successfully treat many, many children. The collaboration between Mbarara University Hospital and mass general physicians and scientists began over a decade ago. Carla Olivier is a nurse practitioner at the Cancer Center with its global health program. They know exactly what to do to help the patient get through this diagnosis. And I think about the patients that we meet here or that we meet in Embarara. The desire to be well and to be healthy is universal. Dr. Christine Barige, director of the Mbarara Regional Referral Hospital, said that with the help of Mass General Hospital, they have built a new ward for pediatric cancer and cancer patients, especially children, have been moved away from those with general illnesses. I appreciate uh, Massachusetts General Hospital for, from the United States who have given us the money which came from the other run that we held at, uh, at uh, the other playgrounds of the university that were able to you know, construct and initiate this. Meanwhile, last year Uganda's only radiotherapy machine used for treating cancer broke down beyond repair. And that left thousands unable to get a potentially life-saving treatment. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up... Work begins on the Uganda-Tanzania crude oil pipeline. Stay with us. Health news and notes. This is Living Better. A total solar eclipse will happen August 21st and will be visible across all of North America. Millions of people will watch, but looking at the sun without protection can cause eye damage and requires safety glasses, such as those made by the NASA-approved American Paper Optics Company, whose president is John Jarrett. In an hour, we can manufacture more than 50,000 glasses an hour from start to finish. NASA officials say homemade filters or sunglasses are not safe for eclipse viewing. But for those that will see the event, it will provide quite a thrill, says NASA scientist Michelle Thaller. You can feel it coming. You can feel the temperature dropping. You can feel things changing and getting very strange. NASA experts say another safe way to view a solar eclipse is through pinhole projection that shows a reflected image of the sun and doesn't require looking directly into the sun's rays. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. In Wednesday's business news, Ethiopia is looking to dominate the African skies. With more details on why the continent may be looking to liberalize the air market, joining us from New York is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino. Jill, how are you? Hi, good afternoon. Ethiopian Airlines, the largest airline in Africa, has ordered 10 additional Airbus A350s, 900s, and set in motion a $345 million airport expansion project to raise the annual passenger capacity at Addis Ababa's Bol International Airport from 7 million to 22 million passengers. It was the first in Africa to include this aircraft in 2016 and the first to operate Boeing 787 Dreamliners in 2012. The airport expansion is backed by China's Exim Bank and is viewed as a move to rival South Africa's OR Tambo International Airport, which received 
received around 21 million passengers last year. Now, speaking of the Sino-Africa relationship, which is aggressively expanding, trade between China and Africa reached 85.3 billion U.S. dollars in the first half of 2017. Now, that's a surge of 19 percent year over year as the two sides strengthen cooperation in a wide range of areas, and that's according to Beijing official data. But uh, Jill, why have the African airlines performed so poorly? This is interesting. According to African Business Magazine, many of Ethiopian Airlines' largest competitors like Kenya Airways and South African Airways have struggled due to a mix of unfavorable conditions, poor strategic management, and a continent-wide lackluster approach to creating favorable environments for African carriers. Non-African airlines operate 80 percent of intercontinental traffic between Africa and the rest of the world, with carriers such as Emirates and Turkish Airlines taking on increasing share, and there have been very few moves to address this imbalance. In addition, many African governments only allow their state-owned carriers to operate domestic flights, leading to increased fares and a lack of competition in air traffic. Now, besides the Chinese investment deal, what has Ethiopian Airways done to outperform other countries? Because it has been leading the skies in the continent. Ethiopian Airlines has managed to weather the storm and emerge from the previous financial year, boasting profit, new planes, and plans. It now flies to more than 120 international destinations. All this points to the need to liberalize the African um, aviation and promote progressive aviation policies. The African continent is made up of 54 countries. 1,500 to 2,000 languages are spoken, and you can't treat it as a homogeneous grouping. The continent is characterized by vast distances, and it has neither good road nor rail systems, although significant investments are being made into rail. Um, but transportation by air would seem to be a strong option for freight, business, leisure, and certainly tourism. Well, Jill, thank you very much. That is uh, Jill Malandrino, Africa 54 business correspondent, reporting live from New York. Now, the presidents of Tanzania and Uganda have laid the foundation stone for a crude oil pipeline project linking their two countries. The project was jump-started after Uganda abandoned an earlier plan to have the line go through Kenya to the port of Lamu. The pipeline is likely to bring big economic changes for the two countries. VOS Mohamed Yusuf, with contributions from Tanzanian reporter Khalid Abubakar Famau, filed this report. Excitement this past weekend as Tanzanians gathered in Chongeleani village to witness the commissioning of a 1,400-kilometer pipeline that will run from Tanga port to Hoima, Uganda. The leaders of Tanzania and Uganda laid the foundation for the pipeline's construction, which is expected to start soon. The $3.5 billion pipeline will carry landlocked Uganda's oil for export to world markets. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni said the benefits will extend beyond his country. This is a great event for the two countries and for East Africa. This pipeline is not just for the crude oil of Uganda. It can become an East African pipeline. Many in Tanzania will agree. We are told 10,000 people will be employed for the start. This construction will create more opportunities for other people. As a Tanzanian, we should support this construction and those doing this work so that the construction can be finished on time. Construction is expected to be completed by 2020. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. It's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Dutch students unveil what may be the greenest car ever. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Kenya, opposition leader Raila Odinga said hackers carried out massive and extensive fraud, resulting in what he asserts are fraudulent vote totals, showing President Uhuru Kenyatta well ahead of him. We stay in Kenya, where police fire tear gas at opposition supporters in Kisumu after Mr. Odinga spoke in Nairobi. In South Africa, President Jacob Zuma survives a no-confidence vote, the first held by secret 
ballot. Finally, in Uganda, informal jobs drive much of the country's income. As the Bureau of Statistics says, about 58% of the population remains unemployed. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. The first car with a biocomposite body structure has been built by students in the Netherlands. The four-seat electric car's chassis uses a combination of biocomposite and bioplastic. The biocomposite has a similar strength weight ratio to fiberglass, allowing the car to be lightweight. The technology implemented in the doors can detect and recognize different users who can gain access using a smartphone or a card with an NFC chip. The car will automatically activate each driver's personal user settings such as playlists, frequent destinations or telephone contacts. Next up at Rainbow Day Camp in the U.S. western state of California, children sing, play ball, make art and participate in other fun activities. But what makes this summer program unique is the campus. It serves transgender children, some as young as four years old. It is a place where they can use the pronoun of their choice and meet other transgender kids and adults, including many of the camp's counselors. Experts say the camp's growth mirrors the sharp increase in transgender children across the United States. For critics who question whether preschool age kids should be allowed to transition so early, developmental psychologist says children can identify their gender at a very young age. And finally, could this be the start of a new shopping trend? It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas at London's department store Selfridges. Visitors to the Oxford Street shopping staple may be surprised to see Christmas trees and bright, shiny baubles on display in August. Selfridges' buying manager says the store's early start to the holiday season is driven by demand from shoppers visiting from outside the British capital this year. The second phase of the Christmas shop will open almost two months earlier than usual on September 4th, rather than late October. And that's what's trending today. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight, at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa, between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching, and a very good night from Washington. Welcome to English in a Minute. An alley is a narrow path between or behind buildings. Up one's alley. Does this expression have to do with city streets? Jonathan, do you have any friends who teach singing? Um, hello. I am a singer. You are? Oh, awesome. Do you 